Okay, let's turn to Titus uh, chapter 1. Titus. Titus. There's not very much in Titus that isn't also found in the books written to Timothy. And so a lot of the things that are in this book uh, we've already had opportunity to consider and I made some comments on. There's, there's quite a few portions that are just directly transposed, it would seem. Um, and the themes that we found to be in the both books of Timothy are, are here again. So it definitely belongs to the same period and mindset of Paul's life as those other two epistles did. We don't have any direct information about the date of it. It would not appear that Paul, at the time that he wrote it, was yet in prison for the second time. We know uh, from information in the letters to Timothy that they were apparently written after his first imprisonment. And in particular, 2 Timothy was written during a second imprisonment. But 1 Timothy and Titus were apparently written between the first and second imprisonments while Paul was at liberty. Uh, this is due simply by the fact that he doesn't mention his imprisonment in these two, but he does in 2 Timothy. It's very promised in 2 Timothy, the fact that he is in chains. But there's no mention of that in either 1 Timothy or Titus. So however many years elapsed between the time he was released from his first imprisonment and the time he was captured in his second is the length of time we do not know. And that length of time would set the outer perimeters for the date of writing of these books, 1 Timothy and Titus. Timothy is a man about which we know a great deal, but Titus is a man we don't know very much about. Titus, in fact, is not even mentioned in the book of Acts, though uh, it's quite clear that he traveled with Paul even in the early days of Paul's ministry because in Galatians, where Paul talked about one of his earlier visits to Jerusalem, apparently before the Jerusalem Council, which was around 50 A.D., and before the second missionary journey, that he took Titus with him. He and Barnabas took Titus with them down to Jerusalem, and Titus, we were told, was a Gentile and was not circumcised. And the reason for mentioning that in Galatians chapter 2 is that Paul and Barnabas did not come under any pressure from the apostles in Jerusalem to circumcise this Gentile at a time when the question of circumcision of Gentile converts was still very much an open one. Paul and Barnabas, of course, held strongly to the view that Gentile converts did not need to be circumcised, but there were some in Jerusalem, including apparently some of the elders in Jerusalem, who felt that uh, Gentiles should be. That is, until the time of the Jerusalem Council. But Titus was a, a fairly early convert. He may have originated in Antioch. Uh, in fact, it seems likely that he was from Antioch, since that was Paul and Barnabas' home church uh, prior to and after their first missionary journey. And uh, probably, uh, although Titus could have been converted to some other place, uh, he was probably converted in Antioch, and though there's no record of him traveling with Paul on any of his missionary journeys, that doesn't mean that he did not, because we don't have complete lists of all of Paul's companions in the book of Acts, and we do know from the book of Galatians that he did go to Jerusalem with Paul on an occasion where the book of Acts, recording that visit, does not mention Titus. Uh, and uh, from our studies in Galatians, my conclusion has been that the visit to Jerusalem spoken of in Galatians 2 is that visit mentioned in Acts chapter 11, mentioned only very briefly as a visit made by Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem to deliver some money to the poor saints in Jerusalem that had been collected in offerings by the Gentile churches. And uh, we are told of that in a single verse at the end of Acts chapter 11, and it mentions Paul and Barnabas, it does not mention Titus. Uh, but we know Titus was with them, so that just tells us that Titus was sometimes with Paul, even though the book of Acts fails to mission. How much Titus traveled with him, we do not know, but he does refer to Titus as his true son in the common faith. Uh, the same expression he used of Timothy. Now, excuse me, we know how much Paul depended on Timothy. We know how faithful Timothy was from the earliest times of Paul's ministry uh, to be a trustworthy assistant and uh, delegate or legate of Paul's. And Titus is called by the same affectionate title and may well have traveled with Paul almost as much 
as Timothy, and certainly we have some evidence from the book of Titus that Paul entrusted to Titus duties similar to those with which he entrusted Timothy, namely the uh, appointment of elders. Now, Timothy was sent to Ephesus, and therefore he did not have to institute eldership because the eldership at Ephesus had been long established before Timothy was sent there. Paul had established the church in Ephesus, and we know that Paul had even had a meeting with the elders of the church in Ephesus on his way uh, to Jerusalem the final time. He met them in Miletus, and that was before Paul sent Timothy there. But Timothy was nonetheless given uh, guidelines for choosing elders, so apparently Timothy had to be a participant in the replacements, perhaps with elders who had died, or simply the church had grown to the point that it needed additional leaders, and Timothy was told how to add elders to a group that already existed. Titus, it would appear, was sent to a church that was brand new and perhaps did not even have elders yet. And he too is told to appoint elders, but the, uh, we don't know for sure, but there's, there's no evidence that there already existed an eldership in Crete where Titus was. Now there's not even a mention in the book of Acts of Paul visiting Crete, except that once during a storm on his final visit to Rome, or I should say a I don't know if that it was his final visit to Rome. Probably wasn't. But, but on, a, on his first visit to Rome, let's put it that way, when he was in chains and being uh, transferred to Rome for trial, that the ship did put in at Crete a little bit uh, just to get out of the weather. Now, whether Titus was accompanying Paul on that occasion and was left in Crete on that occasion, we cannot say since the book of Acts is totally uh, silent on that matter. One thing we do not uh, get in Acts is any evidence that Paul started a church in Crete on that visit. He was a prisoner. It's unlikely they went out and started a church and left Titus in charge of it. It's more likely that on the occasion where Paul stopped at Crete, there were no Christians there. We read in Acts of certain Christians in towns coming out to meet Paul when he was traveling to Rome, but none came out from Crete, and probably at the time that Paul made his first trip to Rome, there were no Christians there. Therefore, it is probable that when Paul was released from his first imprisonment, he went to Crete or, or simply sent Titus there, but more likely Paul went there himself, established the church, and, uh, and left Titus to take care of things. It says in verse 5, For this reason I left you in Crete, which sounds like Paul was in Crete himself with Titus and then left Titus behind when Paul moved him along to other places. Uh, apart from these little bits of information, we don't know very much. We do know that when Paul wrote this letter, as also when he wrote 2 Timothy, he was urging the recipients to come and visit him. He told Timothy in 2 Timothy to come to him before winter and bring his cloak and his parchments. This letter is earlier than that, and for whatever reason he doesn't say, but he wants Titus also to come and visit him uh, wherever Paul might be. He's at Nicopolis, but no one's quite sure where that is. We read in chapter 3, verse 12, When I send Artemis to you, or Tychicus, be diligent to come to me at Nicopolis. For I decided to spend the winter there. Now, uh, Artemis or Tychicus at this point were being considered by Paul to be uh, sent to replace Titus in Crete. And he says, when these people arrive, whether it's Artemis or Tychicus, uh, then come to me. Titus could not leave his post while there was no one there to fill that position. Titus should appoint elders and he should do the things that, are, that he's supposed to do but he should be ready to be relieved of duties upon the arrival of the next messenger from Paul. Paul apparently was not sure in verse 12 whether he was intending to send Artemis or Tychicus. He says Artemis or Tychicus apparently not, realized, not knowing for sure which one it would be. We do know in 2 Timothy that Tychicus is said to have been sent to Ephesus. Uh, was it Ephesus? Let's see. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. Yeah. He says, In Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. So it may be that when Paul wrote Titus, he wasn't sure if he was going to send Artemis or Tychicus to Crete. And he finally decided to send Tychicus to Ephesus and send Artemis to Crete. We have no way of knowing that. Uh, at any rate, the purpose of sending one of these men to Titus was so Titus could leave Crete and come to where Paul was, at Nicopolis. Uh, the implication of chapter 3, verse 12, is that that's where Paul was at the time of writing, in Nicopolis. And there is more than one place in the ancient world known as Nicopolis, and scholars are not sure exactly which place this was. <coughs> but it does seem uh, a further point of evidence that Paul was released from his first uh, imprisonment, because 
and we don't read of him ever going to a place called Nicopolis prior to that. He must have been released and made that trip later. Okay, now, uh, as with the case of the other pastoral epistles, the book of Titus is written uh, in, in order that the church might be set in order. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, Uh, verses 14 and 15 it says these things I write to you though I hope to come to you shortly but if I am delayed I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God which is the church of the living God the pillar and ground of the truth so he's writing about instructions of proper conduct in the church and uh, also Titus is apparently sent for that purpose according to Titus chapter 1 verse 5 for this reason, I let you increase that you should set in order the things that are lacking. Now, orderliness was a concern that Paul had for the church. And one of the main things, apparently, that was to uh, contribute to a more orderly church was the appointment of leaders. It's obviously a, a disorderly situation when a church doesn't have any recognized leaders of any kind. Uh, unfortunately, there's, when there's a leadership vacuum, there's always somebody, usually of the worst character, who wants to rise up and take that place. Often the people who are qualified for leadership don't want the position. And the ones who want it are the ones you least would wish to have as leaders. And so Paul tells Titus he's got to appoint some good men. Uh, that's one of the things apparently that are lacking in Crete. I sent you to set in order the things that are lacking and to appoint elders in every city. Now Crete was an island. It was not a, a city itself. It had other cities upon it. And it would appear that at the time of Paul Rokos there were churches in every city on the island because it says to appoint elders in every city. Now, of course, there might not have been churches in every city and, and elders were only to be appointed in every city where there's a church. That would still be sensible way of looking at his words. But it does suggest that there's more than, say, two cities on that island that had churches established there. And since Paul had left Titus there, it suggests that Paul had been there. I think we can probably assume that Paul had established a number, uh, a string of churches on that island uh, in the period between his first and second imprisonment. Now, <clears throat> one of the problems that existed in Crete was the character of the, Cre the Cretan people themselves. Excuse me. They tended to be lazy and malicious, and Paul establishes that very plainly. He, he even quotes one of their own poets as a, a corroborator of that assessment. And there was a, a particular problem that was seen with uh, troublemakers of the circumcision party. He mentions uh, in verse uh, 10 of chapter 1, there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. Now in many cases, of the circumcision in Paul's writings means Jews. On this in this case, I don't think he means Jews. Sometimes the word circumcision just is a word for the Jews, and uncircumcision is a word for Gentiles. But I don't believe that's the case here. I believe the circumcision here refers to the circumcision party. That group that he refers to in Philippians chapter 3, where he says, beware of the cutters, the concision, meaning a party of people who apparently were close enough intertwined with the, with the church to be considered Christians, but were dangerous. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 2, he says, Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilators, or the cutters, in the Greek. Uh, for we, he says, are the circumcision. I mean, the true circumcised people. Now, in Philippians 3, 2, he therefore uh, speaks of a group of people who are called the cutters, or the circumcision party, as, as scholars usually call them. And almost certainly in Titus 1.10, the circumcision here refers to a party uh, in the church, a sect, that advocated circumcision of Gentiles. Now, that this was not Jewish people advocating it in this case, seems clear from uh, verse 12, chapter 1, verse 12, which says, one of them, a prophet of their own, has said, Cretans, etc. Now, it is one of them... That is, of the circumcision, one of the, one of the troublemakers you mentioned a few verses earlier, is testified against by one of their own who speaks against the Cretans, suggesting that they themselves are Cretans, as this one who spoke against them was a Cretan. And so the people of Crete, that is, the, the natives of the island there, seem to be the troublemakers. Not, not in this case, 
Jews who have come there, although the presence of such a party suggests that perhaps Jewish circumcision people, Judaizers, had been there. But apparently if they had been there, they, they were probably now gone. Because Paul doesn't address his remarks against Jewish people, but against Cretan people who advocate Jewish myths and circumcision and so forth, as we shall see. And that suggests that certain of the Christians in Crete had taken on some of these doctrines from probably a Jewish source originally. Well, uh, he does advocate in this epistle good works, a great deal, which suggests that since the Cretans by nature tended toward laziness, and uh, we, we see that in verse 12 of chapter 1, they're liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons, that when they became converted, they needed to be encouraged to be about doing good things. Uh, he says about these people in verse 16, they profess to know God, but in their works, they deny him. Some of these people had become Christians, or at least professing Christians, but their behavior had not really come into uh, agreement with their profession. Their mouth confessed, but their actions denied that they know God. And so we see of them in the last line of verse 16 that they are disqualified for every good work. And the expression good work is just repeatedly in the book of Titus. For example, um, in verse 7, he tells Titus, in all things to show yourself to be a pattern of good works. Later on, in verse 14 of chapter 2, he says that Christ gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people zealous for good works. In chapter 3, verse 1, he says, Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities to obey, to be ready for every good work. In chapter 3, and verse 8, he says, This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. And he says it again one last time, in chapter 3, and verse 14, And let our people also learn to maintain good works. So in a letter that is so short, I mean only three chapters, and all of them short chapters too, he says no less than, uh, what, six times? He stresses the need for good works. On the average, that comes out to more than, well, that comes out to twice per short chapter. Which means that good works have a much higher profile in this letter than in most of Paul's letters. And we know from Paul's writings elsewhere, and also in Titus, that good works are not a means of salvation, but they are one of the things that accompany salvation. If a person is saved, he will demonstrate it with good works. If he has no good works, he simply demonstrates that he doesn't have a changed life. And so Paul is urging these people to show that they are believers by their behavior, just like James said, uh, the same kind of thing about faith and works. Okay, let's get into Titus chapter 1. We should have no trouble taking this entire book in a session, uh, partly because it's very short altogether. Uh, no more than, uh, how many verses do we got here? 31 plus 15? 46 verses. 46 verses altogether. There are some chapters in First Corinthians longer than that. Uh, and besides that, the, of these 46 verses, many of them cover material we've already, we've already pretty much explored in the earlier epistles written to Timothy. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth, which is according to godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began, but has in due time manifested his word through preaching, which was committed to me according to the commandments of God our Savior. Now, a couple of, uh, well, a few things here I'd like to point out. He has not even given his uh, greeting yet. It comes in verse 4. To Titus, my true son, in the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from, our, from God uh, the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. But he has this uh, lengthy uh, doctrinal kind of statement. And he says that he's a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ according to the faith of God's elect. I have heard some preachers take this verse to mean that a person can only really be an apostle if God's elect believe him to be an apostle. That he says, I'm an apostle according to the faith, that is, of the belief of God's elect. And I've heard this used as if to say 
uh, a person's apostleship is really kind of a subjective thing. If the church accepts him as an apostle, then he's an apostle to them. If he's not accepted in another place as an apostle, then he's not an apostle to them. There may be some support for this idea from Paul saying to the Corinthians, if I'm not an apostle to others, yet surely I am to you, because you are my work in the Lord. But I don't think Paul is acknowledging that he's not an apostle, objectively speaking, and that he's only an apostle with regard to those who recognize him as such. I think he's saying, even if I were not an apostle to others, which he, and he is not, he was not an apostle to the Jews, he was an apostle to the Gentiles, he was not sent to the circumcision, but to the uncircumcision, and those others might mean them. But he says, certainly I am to you. Now what makes a man an apostle, however, is not whether people believe he is or not. There were people in, Cor- in Corinth who did not believe Paul was an apostle. They challenged his apostleship, yet that didn't make him any less an apostle. What makes a person an apostle is whether God, or more specifically, Jesus Christ, has sent him to be an apostle. That's what the word apostle means, one who is sent. And if a person is sent by Christ, he is an apostle, whether one person in the whole world acknowledges it or not. Paul is not here suggesting that his apostleship rests on the affirmation of the recipients of, of his ministry. When he says, I'm an apostle according to the faith of God's elect, the faith there doesn't mean the belief so much as it means the, the Christian religion. You know that the expression, the faith, in the pastorals is used frequently. Paul says, some have departed from the faith. Some have rendered their faith shipwreck. The faith, uh, concerning the faith, they have become shipwrecked, he says. Uh, he says that we should hold on to the faith. Hold fast to the faith. I have fought the good fight. I have kept the faith. Now, the faith is simply a reference to the Christian faith. The Christian religion, we could say. That body of teachings which were the core of Christianity. And so when he says, I am an apostle according to the faith, of God's elect, he doesn't mean uh, subjectively the believing of God's elect make him an apostle or not, but he is an apostle who is is sent as a representative of this faith, the faith, the Christian faith. And so it should not be thought that he's uh, hanging uh, his his apostleship on some contingency of people acknowledging him to be or not, but rather that God's elect have come to buy into something called the faith. And they have done this by acknowledging the truth. This acknowledgement of the truth is what is, how Paul speaks about a person getting converted. If you look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, for example, in verse 25, Paul says that the servant of the Lord in humility must be correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know or acknowledge the truth, and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. So repentance results in people coming to the knowledge of the truth. So getting saved means that you've come to the point where you acknowledge the gospel, which is the truth, and you've come into the faith. And it is that company of people who have acknowledged the truth, and who are in the faith, who he refers to as the elect. And his ministry is devoted and he was sent by Christ to minister for the sake of the elect. He has said that also back in 2 Timothy 2.10. Something like that. 2 Timothy 2.10, he says, Therefore, I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus uh, with eternal glory. So his, he considers his ministry to be principally for the benefit of the elect. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean those who are already saved, although much of Paul's ministry was building up Christians and, and churches and ministering to those who were the elect already converted. But, of course, he believes that we were elect before the foundation of the world. So he's out there ministering to unbelievers for the sake of those among them who may turn out to be elect, who may prove themselves to be elect by their decision to receive Christ. And so Paul associates his ministry with the elect here in, in verse 1. And he says he, in hope of eternal life, verse 2 says, which probably is again referring to, it is either a reference to what the elect have, they have a hope of eternal life, or Paul himself 
as an apostle hopes for eternal life. It's not entirely clear. But that his ministry is related to a hope that exists of eternal life. Now, he mentions the blessed hope later in Titus 2.13. Uh, he says, The blessed hope is the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So eternal life here refers to not just the salvation and life that we now already have, but he's talking about the manifestation of that eternal life in the eternal realm when Jesus returns. Our hope is that eternal life which begins at the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Of course, we have eternal life now in another sense, but there's another dimension of that, another phase of our life that we anticipate when Jesus comes back. It says God has promised this eternal life before time began. We talked about that expression before time began previously. It was a, the expression is found only here and in 2 Timothy 1 9. In 2 Timothy 1 9, he speaks of the grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. When we talked about that passage, I mentioned that one could get the impression that time had a beginning and will have an end. And it gives uh, support to the notion that eternity is a dimension altogether independent of time. But the translation is not accurate. Literally, the Greek says, before time is eternal. Now, both the NIV and the King James and the New King James have rendered this expression in such a way as to make, it, make a reference to the beginning of time. But the actual wording in the Greek, and the New American Standard follows it exactly, is before time is eternal. So we don't really have, in that phrase, a clear reference to time having a beginning. Whatever before time is eternal means, um, is certainly up for grabs. But Paul takes the opportunity in verse 2 of Titus 1 to stress God's uh, inability to lie. God who cannot lie. God is himself the truth. It is against his character to lie. Uh, it, it, it was said also in 2 Timothy that God cannot deny himself in 2 Timothy 2.13. There are some things God cannot do. God cannot do all things. When we talk about the omnipotence of God, it means he has the power to do anything he may choose to do. But it doesn't, does not mean he is capable of doing everything. For instance, he is not capable of breaking his promises. He is not capable of sinning. He is not capable of being tempted to sin, it says in James chapter 1. Because he cannot deny himself. Who he is by nature, he can't be anything other than that. And by nature, he's a truthful God and cannot therefore lie. And so Paul says, listen, we've got uh, our hope is more reliable than anything else because anybody else who speaks to you may well be mistaken or, or lying. God who speaks is incapable of lying. Let God be true. And every man a liar, he said in Romans chapter 3. And uh, so he stresses the faithfulness of God, especially in terms of God's promises here. He's talking about God's promise uh, of giving us eternal life. Now, one thing that's interesting here it says that God promised this before time began or before time is eternal or whatever we want to render it. At any rate, he's talking about something that happened a long time ago, a long time before we were here. God promised this uh, eternal life to us. It's hard to know exactly in what sense he promised it to us before we were born. We can say he purposed it before we were born, but how to, to whom did he promise it? Who, who did he speak this promise to? Um, I'm not really sure. Maybe he promised his father that he that he provide this for us. I don't know, but certainly it is Paul's teaching that our coming into eternal life in our lifetime, as we have, is not something that just caught God by surprise. It's something that's always been known by Him and always intended by Him. And that's again how the same expression is used in Second Timothy. It says that uh, this grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Now, here's a possibility. Grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Remember Paul's expression, in Christ Jesus, means that if we are found in him, then the things that are true of him are true of us too. Uh, if he is dead, we died in him. If he rose again, we rose in him. If he is seated at the right hand of God, then we are seated in Christ in heavenly places. Uh, 
wherever he is, whatever he has experienced, is attributed as having taken place to us. In Ephesians, Paul says that uh, we were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. I'm going to just look at that a minute because this is one of the predestination passages um, that is certainly worthy of having some concept of its meaning. Um, it says in Ephesians 1 4, just as he chose us in him, that is in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us to the adoption of sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Now, when it says that God chose us in him, it should be understood that Paul does not necessarily say he chose us to be in him. Now, that may be true, but that's not what it says. That might be something that you could establish from some other passage. But what it actually says is he chose us in him. He also says we are accepted in him. A few verses later, verse 6. Now, what does it mean he chose us in him? I hope I don't lose any of this, but it's important to me to know whether God chose me as an individual to become a Christian. And whether that's what this verse says. Now, I do believe that every one of us can argue that God chose us in, in a certain way that people who don't get saved were, were not chosen. For example, he certainly chose to have the gospel arrive to our ears at a time when we were not too hardened to receive it, else we wouldn't be Christians today. Certainly the fact that he sovereignly allowed us to be born in a country where the gospel is available as opposed to being born in some tribe where it's not available had something to do with his choice. Two, upon what he based this choice, we can't say he put some people in advantaged conditions. But is that the same thing as saying he chose certain individuals to get saved and chose some not to get saved? I don't think so. But it says he chose us in him. What I believe that means is just as we are accepted in him, which means Christ is accepted, and we share in his acceptedness when we are in him, just like he's died and risen and ascended, we share in his having died and risen and ascended as we are in him. Uh, these are things that are true of him and they become true of us as we come to be in him. So if we're accepted in Christ, or accepted in the blood of Ephesians 1, 6, it is only because he is accepted and if we are found in him, we participate or we, we partake of his acceptedness. And if we are chosen in him, it could be argued he is the one who is chosen. God chose Jesus from the, beginning, from the foundation of the world and we, by becoming Christians, have partaken of that chosenness. We have been chosen in him. It doesn't necessarily say that we were chosen to be in him. But because we are in him, we are regarded as chosen because he's chosen. We, we take advantage of his chosenness and his acceptableness, and therefore we could be said in Christ to be chosen and accepted because he is chosen and accepted. And therefore the chosenness before the foundation of the world could and I know several authors who argue this way, could be said to be Christ who was chosen before the foundation of the world, and only us, by extrapolation, as we come to be in Christ, then we are also in the state of having been chosen uh, because we were in Him and He was chosen. That may sound too esoteric and weird and strange, but unfortunately, any views of foreknowledge and predestination are going to have some elements of uh, esotericness about them. I mean... How God knows the future is, is one of the things never explained. So, I mean, it's, that explanation is not any more esoteric than any other. But it would suggest not that God chose certain people to be in and certain people to be out, but that he chose Jesus for the foundation of the world, and anyone who is in him is chosen in him, just like he's chosen. Uh, because chosen because they are in him. And uh, he was chosen before the beginning of the world, and so we are chosen before the beginning of the world in him. Uh, we participate on the, of the, in that eternal chosenness and eternal acceptableness. Anyway, I don't know if that's clear or if I'm muddling that all up, but, but what it says in Titus that he promised us eternal life before time began, he could mean by that he promised it in Christ, to us in Christ. That is, he promised Christ this destiny, and that was before the time began, and we are now participating in that because we're now in Christ. That's uh, a maybe strange 
idea, but like I said, there's more than one author who's championed that idea, and it, it makes some sense to me. If you think about it, well, it might make some sense to you. Um, now, in contrast to the before time began, bringing things up to date in verse 3, but has in due time manifested his word through preaching. Now, before time began, he promised this. But nowadays, in modern times, in due time, he's manifested it, made it clear. Uh, he's fulfilled the promise by preaching the gospel, which has, was committed to me, Paul says, according to the commandment of God our Savior, implying that God commanded Paul to be a preacher, chose him to be a preacher, didn't have any person, and he's not self-appointed. To Titus, my true son, in our common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and our Lord and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Nothing very unusual in that uh, greeting. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. Now, apparently, as I said earlier, the churches had been established in Crete, but they must have been young enough that there had not yet been appointed elders. Paul perhaps had been able to do a, a swing through Crete, hitting several major cities and converting a few people in each place, starting self multiplying groups of disciples in those areas but it had not yet been organized or, or made orderly as he says they had to be set in order as churches uh, he doesn't say uh, appoint elders in every church it's interesting but in every city of course he implies in every church but the lack of the word church there may suggest that these Christians were not yet even ordered into companies that could even be called churches yet there may have been just a few scattered converts in each place and Paul's telling Titus, now I want you to get these people together as a group and appoint leaders over them and, and form them and meld them into a, what we could actually call a church. In every city, there needs to be some leadership of the Christians that are there. Now, we, we know something about elders. We talked about elders and deacons when we were talking about 1 Timothy chapter 3. There also we had qualifications for an elder, as we also do here. If any man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children not accused of dissipation or insubordination. For a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convince those who contradict. Now, in the list of qualifications for elders here, we see a lot of repetition of what we had in Titus. Most of it, I mean in Timothy, First Timothy 3, has most of the same qualifications mentioned. Uh, reference to the man's family life seems to be foremost because he has to prove himself a good steward in his family before he's entrusted with the bigger family, the household of God. Now, you know the story that Jesus told about the stewards who were given a certain amount of money and left and they were checked on later. And when the time of accounting came, those who had done well in their stewardship were given more. More to be a steward over. And uh, in the case of those parables, Jesus is saying, in fact, he says, you have been faithful over a few things. I will make you a steward over or rule over many things. You were faithful over ten talents. I'll make you a rule over ten cities he said, uh, suggesting that God will test us in uh, less risky stewardships to see if we qualify to be entrusted with greater risks of stewardship. Stewardship is simply managing somebody else's property. And Paul says elsewhere in 1 Corinthians 4 that what stewards are required to be is faithful. He said it is required in stewards that he be found faithful. You know, he's trustworthy. He's not going to rip off his master. He's not going to take what his master gives him and abuse it, waste it, use it on himself. He's going to faithfully use his master's goods in his master's interest. Now, Paul suggests here that a man's family is something like a stewardship. He's a steward of God. And therefore, he must prove himself to be a good steward in the family before he's entrusted with leadership of the church. That's what he says in verse seven, after he's mentioned the case of the man's wife and children, and what the man's family looks like, he says, for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God. That is, in terms of his former stewardship, before he was appointed to be an elder, he had a stewardship over his family. Was he blameless in that area? As a steward of God? If so, well then he is up for consideration for greater things. 
If he's been faithful in ten talents, consider ten cities for him this time. If he's been faithful uh, in ruling his household, then now he should be considered uh, promoted, as it were, to the household of God. Here's one of the places in the Bible, there are more than one, uh, where we see that the word bishop is simply synonymous with elder. Because he says in verse 5, appoint elders in every city. And in the description of elders, he says, for a bishop must be blameless. I've said before, elder, the Greek word presbyteros, simply means an older man. The word bishop is episkopos, which literally means an overseer. So the overseers of the church were the elders. And it would appear also that elders were a plurality in each city. Notice the plural in verse 5. Point elders, plural, in every city, singular. Likewise in James, if any sick among you, let him call for the elders, plural, of the church, singular. Each church in each city had a plurality of elders. And we don't read anywhere in the Bible of a pastor of a church. Um, or any church having an individual who was the sole leader. But the elders apparently jointly, uh, cooperatively shared the burden of shepherding the flock. And uh, it says in verse 7, he should not be quick-tempered. That in itself would disqualify many men who are both elders and pastors today. Uh, recently, it was that very fault that caused a, a pastor of one of the churches in this town, uh, on the other side of town, to be demoted and replaced. He was an older man and had been a pastor for a very long time, but everybody who worked with him knew that he had a short fuse and he had a caustic tongue and uh, he offended and t- intimidated almost everyone who worked with him. And, and uh, if they had held to this qualification for elders, the man never would have been an elder. The interesting thing is the denomination to which he belonged is a denomination who, because of this statement, um, the husband of one wife, has a policy of not allowing anyone to be a pastor in their denomination who's been married more than once, regardless of the circumstances of the previous uh, marriage. Of course, unless they were widowed. But uh, if they were divorced, regardless of what explanation can be given for it, regardless of any considerations, if they're divorced or married, they cannot be a pastor in that denomination. Because they want to hold to a strict interpretation of husband and one wife. And yet, while they exclude some excellent men of high character from pastorship, because of that, holding to that one line here, they allow certain men who've only had one wife to be pastors and elders who are men of poor character in these other areas. And in this particular case, quick tempered was, uh, was a problem. Uh, not given to wine. The word given to means enslaved by wine. So it, it's, not, it's not forbidding that he, that he ever touch wine, but he cannot be a man who needs alcohol or who has any kind of dependency on alcohol. He's certainly not one who gets drunk. Not violent. Not greedy for money. Now, how in the world can you tell if somebody's greedy for money or not? It's a lot easier to tell if someone isn't sometimes than if they are. If they're not doing it for money, if they don't get money for it, then you know they're not doing it for the money. And uh, some of you read a book that I read recently, too, called uh, Will the Real Heretics Please Stand Up? I was interested to find there in quoting the church fathers from the 2nd and 3rd century that uh, it was considered heresy for an elder of the church to receive pay by the church fathers up until the time of Constantine in the beginning of the 4th century. Uh, the, all the church fathers believed it was, it was a person who received pay